Hello and welcome to the Ossington Circle. I'm your host, Justin Podur. Today I'm here with Middle East-focused journalist John Elmer. We'll be talking about Egypt and Syria, revolutions, armed struggles, and civil wars. Um, but let's start with the Middle East. So, John, um, this has been a week uh, of a, a rapid events going on in Egypt, uh, a lot going on in Syria. Um, let's, why don't we start with what's been happening in Egypt? What's your analysis as someone who's been watching uh, the pa Egypt in the past two years of what's been going on? Yeah, I mean, it's a really very interesting developments, you know, one year after the uh, legitimate election of the first democratically elected government in uh, many generations in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, mass demonstrations, uh, some say, on a precedent, without precedent in Egyptian history, even without, uh, you're even including the uprising in uh, 2011 that uh, overthrew Mubarak in the first place. I think... Uh, it exposed some of the fissures uh, and narratives of the sort of larger Arab Spring uh, itself. I think that uh, the military, uh, and I think the Egyptian activists on the street would be the first to say that the Egyptian military uh, l largely remained in control after uh, the Mubarak ouster. I think it's possible to, uh, with reflection to look back and say that what ended up happening was uh, closer to a palace coup than it was to uh, the toppling of a regime. Um, the army's place within Egyptian society is so entrenched uh, that they really hold the trump card in politics. And I think what we're seeing right now is, uh, is on the street uh, the sort of uh, use of popular dissent by the army to uh, sort of reaffirm its control uh, over Egypt. And of course, Egypt is, is and was the cornerstone of the American imperial project in the Middle East. Uh, the regime, the military, receives the second most uh, foreign military assistance from the United States of any other country aside from Israel and tied to uh, Israel. Um, and so it really needs to be seen in that light. And I think, uh, as most of the things we'll talk about today, I think you can really see the American uh, influence and presence uh, throughout in what really has been a counter-revolution to the Arab uprisings that began in 2011. Well, I see it a little differently, but um, I, do think, I do think you're completely right about the regime. So I think the ouster of Mubarak was not necessarily a change of regime because getting rid of the president isn't the, isn't the end of the story. That military structure remains in place. Um, in places like Pakistan, that army structure is referred to as the establishment. And the establishment in Pakistan is the military and they have interests in a range of businesses from cereal to insurance to cement. Uh, and they have interests in land and they also control the monopoly of violence in the country. And that continued to be the case in Egypt despite the change of government to the Muslim Brotherhood. But um, now that the Muslim Brotherhood government has fallen, we're still in a position where the regime is intact. And so I, the way I see it is um, the Egyptian revolution is ongoing. Um, and it's certainly not come to a conclusion. I, I like this quote where I think it was uh, someone from the Chinese Communist Party that was asked in the 60s or 70s, I think it was Zhou Enlai, who was asked, you know, what, what's your opinion of the French Revolution? And he said, it's too early to tell. And so I think, um, I do think Egypt is definitely a place to watch uh, for the for the foreseeable future. Absolutely, and so do the Americans moving to yeah. uh, warships off the coast of Egypt for any potentialities. And I think uh, I think that's a fair statement. I think that it's uh, it's very likely that uh, the uprisings against Morsi can be seen as a continuum, a straight continuum of the uprisings 
uh, against the Mubarak regime, the question will be, uh, will those uprisings push further uh, into the realm of influence of the military, which, as you said, uh, runs through all aspects of society. It's not simply a political regime. It's an economic regime. It's actually a social regime as well. There's a, virtually a caste system in Egypt for its military, and that was uh, put in place very pointedly uh, in order to keep uh, you know, this American term stability, which means keep American allies in their place uh, against the will of their people. And so uh, I think the revolution definitely has its work cut out for it. And it was, uh, it was very, it was amazing to see uh, army helicopters dropping flags, uh, warplanes, uh, you know, painting hearts in the sky over Tahrir Square. Uh, I think it's definitely uh, confused the situation, and uh, I think there's definitely more to be written uh, about Egypt. Another point before we move on is, as you said, the Americans are watching this very closely because Egypt is the linchpin of their plans in the region, and that's partly because Egypt is the big Arab country. It's the biggest population, it's the cultural center, and it's always played the central role in the Arab world. And I think, you know, our viewers... Um, may not realize that, but but it is it's in a sense it's the place to watch because it's the cultural, political, and potentially economic center of the Arab world. In the in the '60s or the '50s, it was they were trying to create this United Arab Republic, and that was again centered on uh, Egypt, Egypt and Syria. So maybe we should move on to that discussion. So Syria has been um, the site of a significant civil war. Uh, figures are in the tens of thousands, probably around 90,000 people have lost their lives in this war. Um, there are multiple players now. There's Iran, there's Saudi Arabia, there's Qatar, there's Lebanon, Hezbollah, and of course there's the United States and Israel all um, playing some role in what's going on in the, in the Syrian conflict, um, all with different agendas, some of which can be analyzed politically, uh, economically, in terms of imperialist agendas, um, religious and sectarian agendas, all of which is happening at the same time. So how do we start to understand a situation like that? I mean, I think you have to sort of look at even the Arab uprisings themselves. I mean, you could pick a, a spot to start. Uh, people in the Middle East are fond of peak, uh, picking the Sykes-Picot Agreement, uh, going back to the end of the Second World War, the, or the First World War, uh, dividing up the, the spoils of empire between the British and the French um, that created the modern Middle East states and drew borders that ran uh, against the... Uh, sort of communal interests of the people uh, in the region uh, and have con con been continued to be enforced uh, because the Middle East is, of course, the economic engine uh, of the world in a fossil fuels era. Uh, there's significant strategic interests long term uh, for uh, for the United States, but also for other players within the region. I think uh, the desire by Israel to see the situation in Syria uh, remain chaotic um, has created, uh, I think, a really uh, a depressing situation of effectively proxy war uh, that's happening in Syria, which I think at this point in the game by the summer of 2013 uh, is quite a bit removed from uh, the idea of the popular revolution that, uh, that I think began uh, in 2011. Right. So, so a popular revolution against a long-running dictatorship, which responded brutally, and then the revolution became progressively militarized. And the most effective military fighters in the opposition forces turned out to be uh, very sectarian and ultimately backed by these powers with fairly sectarian agendas. Is that a... Yeah, yeah. I mean, chauvinist, uh, I mean, it's... The, the sectarian nature is not simply uh, an intercommunal, it's uh, plain bigotry. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really been one of the most uh, disconcerting elements of what has come out of the war. The American project in the Middle East, particularly if we go back to the 2003 
uh, war in Iraq was to play off the sectarian uh, differences between peoples, whereas in the previous uh, in the previous regime uh, in the region, uh, in Iraq particularly, the idea was to keep a central state together. Many of the same players uh, within the Bush administration who carried out the war in Iraq in 2003 uh, were the, many of the same players that carried it out in 1991 uh, during the Gulf War. Um, and at that time, there was a pointed uh, decision to not invade Baghdad uh, because of the fear that uh, effectively what they would do would be overthrow uh, a secular Sunni regime in favor of effectively an Iranian-backed Shia regime in uh, Iraq. And that, uh, I think, you know, Condoleezza Rice's birth pangs of a new Middle East, I think it was to play along these uh, sectarian fissures and to exploit them. Uh, whenever possible, and to turn, uh, you know, a, a pretty classic divide and conquer type strategy uh, that's been used from time immemorial. Yeah, and it seems like there's a there's two strategies at work here. One was, as you said, it used to be the case that that the U.S. would try to support what they would call stability, and stability would be these kinds of dictators like Mubarak, Saddam Hussein, uh, a whole range of dictators in Latin America. Uh, in order to, to achieve a stable kind of regime for themselves. Uh, but now it seems that chaos is a kind of acceptable state. Iraq was invaded and destroyed in a way that created a lot of chaos. Syria and the civil war is, is being conducted and supported in a way that generates a lot of chaos. So it seems like stability isn't really the same kind of value as it used to be. Well, I think that's one of the things that has come back to bite the Americans in this situation, and the Israelis, I think, see it most clearly, and that is that uh, chaos is beneficial. The destruction, as you say, of, the, of Iraqi society was, in terms of military strategic politics, was good for Israel uh, and would potentially have been for the United States. Um, I think that we need to look at the sort of uh, the chaos model, the destruction as a model, um, because the Israelis don't want a clean victory by either side in this conflict. And you can remember going back to uh, late 2011 when Defense Minister Ehud Barak said, you know, it would be days before the Assad regime would fall. Everyone was pl uh, planning for a sort of post Assad. Uh, situation within weeks, literally, uh, of the uprising beginning. And I think uh, when you look at Assad's record with Israel, I think uh, you know you could make a very good case that 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 he fit that mold of stability. Even if you look into the pre-uprising period, there was strong overtures from the American regime, from the American administration, to bring Assad's regime into uh, a multi-track peace process. Uh, particularly over the goal, the, the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. Um, I mean, you could see even just through the CIA's uh, rendition program, uh, the stories that we're familiar with here in Canada, Maharar was taken to Syria. Uh, and effectively, Syria acted as an American ally. Of course, there's the sort of anecdotal stuff as well, like that Vogue uh, article about the Assad family uh, that portrayed them as a sort of westernizing uh, uh, and moderate, uh, as the term is. And of course, we see this be applied to the dictatorships that are seen as allies to the United States. And so Assad was given that treatment. He was given the treatment of the ki of King Hussein in Jordan, right. uh, King Abdullah in Jordan. He was given given uh, uh, you know, the treatment that the Gulf monarchies get, where as long as they're given this term moderate, uh, whether they're elected, whether they're police states, uh, you know, whether they're religious, uh, ethnic religious uh, states, uh, you know, with super rights for one group of people over another, we, the, the concept of stability is willing to back these regimes. And I think uh, Assad, if you look at the border situation with Israel uh, and Syria, Israel's border with Syria was quiet uh, for a generation. 
uh, for our entire lifetimes. And so uh, I think, you know, you have to watch what you wish for uh, in, in terms of Israel strategically. Iraq uh, was destroyed and its uh, social and economic, political, military infrastructure was destroyed. Uh, but what has come up in his place is not an ally uh, to the American and Israeli project in the region. It's an Iranian ally. Uh, what comes out of the situation in Syria is it looks increasingly clear day by day that the Assad regime is not going to be toppled in the way that uh, that planners believed it would be. Um, and so now you have a situation where you have fire all around Israel. Uh, and the, the statements coming out of the uh, Israeli military planners and whatnot is that this has been the quietest period in Israel. They're really sort of trumpeting this stability idea. But I think if you look just objectively at the region, uh, things are not uh, as secure for Israel as they would have, uh, as, their, as their political uh, PR posture would, would indicate. And, and, and where are... Where are the Palestinians in all this? You've spent most of your journalistic, your career reporting on occupied Palestinian territories. They're, they're, whatever happens in Syria, in Egypt, and certainly what, whatever the Israelis do affects them tremendously. So what's going on uh, in, the, in occupied Palestine right now? Well, I think one of the interesting things about the Palestinians is, is amid this sort of sectarian hysteria that the sort of Gulf media particularly has drummed up, uh, particularly since Hezbollah entered uh, Syria, has been uh, to play along the Sunni uh, Shia uh, sectarian lines. And I think when you compare the hysteria in the region to what we've seen in Palestine, the Palestinians have been very cautious. Uh, on the situation in Syria, and I think uh, notably cautious. Um, Syria, of course, uh, is, is a conflicted situation in the sense that uh, while definitely not an anti-imperialist force, there's no doubt that the Assad regime provides, provided space, important military political space for uh, the Palestinians in the diaspora to uh, have alliances and to carry out uh, military alliances and political and diplomatic space to operate within Damascus. Uh, for example, uh, Hezbollah's rocket program uh, was taken uh, and, and shared with the Palestinians uh, through Hezbollah commander Imad Mugnia. Uh, in Damascus, and in fact, Mugnia was killed in Damascus uh, after meeting with Palestinian factions. And so that sort of, uh, the, the Palestinian example actually sort of um, uh, undermines the sectarian uh, Shia-Sunni split because you have Hezbollah, uh, the Iranians, uh, backing the military wings of the Palestinians in such a way that uh, it has really transformed the nature of the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, if you look back to the November uh, 2012 war in Gaza, which was sort of roundly celebrated as a victory by the Palestinians, definitely uh, not seen as a victory for the Israelis. Uh, that's very, that war was very much a product of the alliance between uh, uh, Hezbollah and the Palestinians. So. Uh, Palestinians, I think, have treaded lightly. They always try to uh, tread lightly, particularly of late in, in internal conflicts, uh, but when you have Arab conflicts. But when you have, uh, you know, significant Palestinian populations in all of the countries that we've been talking about, um, they're definitely uh, always on the front lines. So, are you uh, just to rephrase what you're saying? You're saying that if if there was a a really crude Sunni Shia conflict that was deeply rooted and ancient in the in the Arab and Muslim world, then we could predict that Palestinians who are majority Sunni would be on the side of um, Qatar and Saudi Arabia and the United States when in fact um, this sort of resistance bloc that you're talking about that involves Iran and Lebanon or at least Hezbollah um, those are Shia powers and Assad as well, so. and Assad, and then the Palestinians are Sunni. So this Sunni Shia divide is not as simple or simplistic as uh, perhaps is portrayed. That's right, and I think that the Palestinians, uh, the sort of cautious nature that the Palestinians have taken to that, is actually uh, more, I think, more of a story uh, 
uh, than the times that get coverage, like when uh, a mid-level Hamas leader, uh, for example, uh, like Ahmed Yusuf said, were, you know, that uh, this Hezbollah should pull out of Syria, that you know, a critical uh, anti-Assad type uh, Positions um, are more are not positions themselves. They're more statements from mid-level uh, sort of Politburo members rather than uh, organizational pushes. And I think when you look particularly at the armed wings of the Palestinians, uh, that alliance with Hezbollah over the years uh, and going forward uh, is something that's seen in strategic terms. And I think. Definitely, Syria has muddied the waters, but uh, yeah, in terms of the crude Sunni Shia binary, I think it's uh, m more notable that Palestinians don't show up uh, along those crude lines. Well, just one last note, maybe on this, as as Western, you know, people concerned about human rights, concerned about the Arab world, concerned about the people of Syria, I've seen. Um, statements by activists that I respect saying things like, we oppose any military or diplomatic solution that leaves Assad in power. And to me, it seems to me that ending the conflict through some kind of negotiation would be the best way to save, as, save more lives um, than to insist that the only outcome is the only acceptable outcome is for the for the regime to go through a military victory, which is clearly not going to happen. And, that, and that's Assad has sort of mar staked his ground from day one that that's uh, not going to happen in terms of uh, you know he will be a part that regime will be a part of whatever the solution yeah, is. So is Russia said the same thing, and so is Iran said the same thing. Absolutely. So and so the the I, the American sort of policy, which isn't much of a policy, kind of play out of both sides of their mouths on this. Uh, but the idea to sort of arm uh, the factions that are opposing the sort of Al-Qaeda-linked groups uh, is effectively setting up a, well, saying that there can be no negotiations, is really setting up a dynamic for uh, a real generational civil war. Um, because the thing about Syria is that it's not backroom stuff, um, it's not secret missions, it's very clearly the powers have their cards on the table, where they stand. Uh, and particularly, of course, since uh, Hezbollah joined the war uh, and clearly articulated their reasons for doing so, um, as well as the United States, Obama, uh, just last week, uh, saying that uh, there would be military support for uh, the Syrian rebels, which, of course, there has been from the United States and from the CIA for uh, per, since day one, really, of the uprising. But the fact that it's now a verbalized policy, um, I think, is is really setting the region up for uh, a long and bloody civil war. And I think it's not simply just in Syria. And that's the, the, the Syrian war has, uh, has bled across the borders. The war is now in Lebanon, and especially the war is in Iraq. Uh, the the Al-Qaeda attacks in Iraq uh, are happening literally by the dozens each day. And these are not uh, uh, attacks that are clashes in, in flashpoint spots. These are attacks that are very bigoted, crudely bigoted sectarian attacks inside mosques, uh, inside cafes where people are watching football games. Um, you know, these types of targeted civilian uh, terror campaigns uh, are are very much linked to the war in Syria and are in many cases the very same actors that are transiting the border and carrying out the war on both fronts and I think that's the sort of protracted nature of the Saudi and Qatari assistance and the American sort of waffling or uh, even worse the arming of one faction to create a sort of three-polled civil war uh, is really, I think, uh, uh, it's a harbinger, I think, uh, potentially of, uh, of some bitter days ahead. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I want, to, um, I want to talk a bit about yet another region, uh, two regions actually, Canada and Afghanistan, because John and myself have chapters in a book called Empire's Ally, Canada and the war in Afghanistan. Um, John's chapter is about Canada's building of a capacity for intervention in other countries. 
and uh, my chapter is on the incompatibility of counterinsurgency and development. Um, so pick up Empire's Ally, and uh, that's it for today.